Okay, so Diane, if you are ready, we're going to get started here. Sure. Um, I'm not too sure if your messages have gone through to all of our panelists and attendees, so I'm just going to copy and paste them and resend them in the chat. Um, and then we'll also link it on our Facebook after the fact. So thank you for sharing all of these. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I believe we're live on Facebook here. Okay. That's perfect. Um, so to start off, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Alexandra Holick. Um, it's a pleasure to be hosting and moderating this panel on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, I am here with the lovely Diane Francis. Um, I will read her bio now and introduce you folks to her. Um, so Diane Francis is a well-known journalist, author, broadcaster, and editor-at-large at the National Post. She writes a newsletter twice weekly on America and for publications around the world and is a regular contributor to radio and television, the Financial Post, Post Media, the newspaper chain, Atlantic Council in DC, Singularity University Hub, the American Interest in DC, and Kiev Post, among other publications. She is a sought after speaker at conferences on technology, geopolitics, the US, Canada, business, energy, Russia, Ukraine, and white collar crime. She is also on the faculty at Singularity University in Mountain View, California, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC, a distinguished professor at Ryerson University, and is on the boards of Hudson Institute's kleptocracy, sorry, kleptocracy initiative and the Canada US Law Institute. She is a member of Abundance 360, created by Silicon Valley influencer and space pioneer Peter Diamandis, who leads this exclusive group of 250 entrepreneurs. She also has served as a director on the boards of two New York Stock Exchange listed corporations. Ms. Francis is an expert on Silicon Valley, future technology, geopolitics, energy, business, and white collar crime, and has written 10 books covering government corruption, business fraud, money laundering, politics, immigration, and economics. She has traveled and covered major news events, including the fall of the Berlin Wall, the dismantling of the Soviet Union, Ukraine's Orange Revolution, the biggest boiler room stock fraud in Amsterdam, Mandela's ascension to power in South Africa, the Colombian cocaine trade, and the Quebec referendum on separation from Canada, to name some highlights. She has won numerous national writing awards, received three honorary doctorates, and in, two, and in 2009, was given the Friend of Ukraine Trisub Award. She has, be, she has been a visiting fellow at Harvard University's Joan Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. In 1991, she became editor of Canada's Financial Post, the first woman editor of a national daily newspaper in Canada. So Diane, welcome again. Um, if you'd like to say a few opening words, please go right ahead. Not really, that was quite the introduction. <laughs> you, you threw in the kitchen sink. I've been a journalist for a long time, you've got to remember. Um, I uh, became a journalist at 29 and I'm 74 years old now. So uh, I've been around uh, through a lot of news cycles. Absolutely, 74 years young, I have to add. <laughs> um, so getting right into what we're gonna be discussing today, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Russia has been building this new pipeline called the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to go around Ukraine. It is on track for completion by June 2021, at which point Russian forces may no longer be concerned with damaging or destroying the Brotherhood pipeline. This will put a crippling hold on Ukraine that relies on Russian gas for survival. If completed, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would allow for Russian gas to be transported underneath the Baltic Sea directly to Germany. In addition to the serious security implications, the, eco the ecological risks of the pipeline are tremendous and will further add to Europe's greenhouse gas emissions. So getting right into the first question we have prepared here, how does the completion of Nord Stream 2 affect European political stability, North American political stability? And do you think it's a ge geopolitical mistake? Yes, uh, okay, I'll, uh, okay, I'll start. Uh, start by giving you the bigger picture. Uh, Russia is uh, a gigantic producer of oil and natural gas, and uh, its uh, only major uh, foreign currency export earner is 
the, the export of oil and natural gas. And uh, so that's been the case for decades. So it props up the whole country. They don't have a lot else going for them, to be honest. Uh, so what happened was after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union in 1992, of course, Russia no longer had control over all the countries between it and Western Europe. So it, it lost Ukraine first, in fact, and then it lost uh, Belarus and so on and so forth, all the Soviet republics. But most importantly, it lost all the satellites in Central and Eastern Europe from Romania to Czech Czechoslovakia and so on. What they were doing up until that point was they had a nice cozy arrangement. They just built pipelines through Belarus to get to Northern uh, Europe, I guess via uh, Poland. Uh, and they built pipelines uh, through Ukraine to get the gas to Southern and the rest of Europe. Uh, and, and that was fine as long as they controlled these two countries and they were not independent. Uh, so what happened was uh, Putin decided that this was not going to be a good idea and he was having a lot of trouble with Ukraine and he wanted to obviously uh, bring Ukraine and Belarus back into a new Soviet Union. So what he needed to do was he wanted to become less dependent on these countries uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, he wanted to take them over and tell them what to do and they didn't want that. And they were fighting him uh, on price and other, other things. Uh, secondly, uh, if he was going to plan to reinvade them, which we now know he wanted to do in Ukraine for sure, he's effectively done that without invading it, but he's effectively taken control over Belarus this year. But um, what he needed to do was not, he, he, he couldn't invade a country and, and have a war if his pipeline was going to be disrupted and, and, uh, and his, therefore his cash flow. So he started construction on four pipelines to bypass Belarus and Ukraine, two in the north and two in the south. So I hope people sort of can look up a map because it's very complicated what I'm going to tell you, but if you look at the map of, uh, of, of Central and Eastern Europe and Russia and down to Turkey, so that you'll see what he decided to do. He decided to build four underwater pipelines to take gas to Europe, bypassing Belarus and Ukraine, two in the bottom called Turk Stream 1 and Turk Stream 2, and two at the top called Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. He finished Nord Stream 1 and it's been operating. He finished Turk Stream 1 and it's been operating, but mostly supplying Russian gas to Turkey. But Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2 are much bigger, going to carry a lot more gas. They are nearly complete, both of them. And what they will do is completely allow him to ignore his pipeline in Belarus, Ukraine, therefore invade or financially cripple both and then make Europe totally dependent on Russia directly. And that's the problem. It was, it is a, as I've called it, these pipelines, all four of them, they're not pipelines, they're weapons. They're weapons in the reconquest of Europe and of, of, of the republics that used to be part of the Soviet Union. And that's the idea. And the Europeans are foolish to have allowed this. But what he's also done is he's co-opted them by offering a great deal of money to partners in Turkey and partners in Germany so that they receive this gas and they get a big discount, which will build their industries and they will ship it on to the rest of Europe. But they will do it according to what Russia dictate, dictates to them and the volumes and so on. So Russia's already interrupted gas flows over political disagreements with Ukraine uh, in the past several times. And you know I don't understand how the Europeans can possibly believe that the Russians will be a reliable supplier who won't play political games and hold them hostage. It's done that all along with Ukraine and Belarus. 
And so, you know, the, the, the situation in Belarus, for instance, now that their leader has really kind of surrendered to Putin and that country is back in the Russian orbit is because they completely controlled Belarus's oil and gas supplies. And when Belarus made moves to be independent, they cut them off. So they were much more ruthless with Belarus than they could be with Ukraine, mostly because Ukraine was the supplying Russian gas, which was the lifeblood of, of, of Central and Eastern Europe. So he, he didn't want to go that far. So what he's done is he's bypassed. So this is a bigger plan. This is not just about Nord Stream uh, 2. This is about uh, you know, his, his intention to regain the parts of Europe he lost in 1991, 92. It's a very serious issue. And uh, you know, the battle has been going on. What's very frustrating is that the Germans have done it in defiance of all the other members of the European Union who have voted against this pipeline coming in at all. The Parliament of Europe, the European Commission, the countries around, Poland is going crazy over this. I mean, everybody is upset. But Germany says, the heck with you, we're doing it because they make a lot of money. And, you know, and because Germany cares about Germany. So it's, it's, it's also served another purpose of Putin's, and that is to divide Europeans against one, one another. So what happened was the Americans came along and said, you can't get your act together. This is unacceptable. This is a national security issue for Europe. You can't be dependent on this guy. Look what he's doing. Look how he is. And so what they did was they came up with draconian sanctions to stop Nord Stream 2. Not to stop the other pipelines, but just Nord Stream 2 because it's biggest and it's huge. So they have, they have passed them and, uh, and Russia always finds a way around them. And then they passed another one. And Russia is just plain ignoring the fact that sanctions can stop them from construction immediately. Now that brings us to the next thing. And that is why hasn't Joe Biden enforced the sanctions that President Trump and both parties in Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives, Republicans and Democrats wanted to impose on this pipeline. Why hasn't he done that? That's a big question because Biden has personally said the pipeline is a bad deal for Europe. So my guess is that perhaps he's holding it back as some kind of bargaining chip for something else. But I just, uh, that's where we're at. So we're kind of in limbo. So the article that I wrote today that I referred to on the chat line in my newsletter says, you know, if anybody thinks that the oil pipeline shutdown in the United States that's just ended is not anything to do with Putin and an attack on the United States, they need their head read. It has its fingerprints all over it. There is nothing that happens outside of Ru inside Russia, and apparently it's supposed to be a gang of criminals. I don't buy that. And if it is a gang of criminals, they're there operating it at the pleasure of Putin's government. Nobody does anything in Russia without the government knowing about it and approving of it. So it's indirect. It's it's kind of a you know a. a I call it punking. I call it Putin, Putin's Putin punked. Uh, Putin's Putin punks America. That's what I called it. That's what he's doing. He's taking a step. He's using another proxy, and he's doing the same thing he did in Crimea with the little green men. Only this is a pipeline shutdown. He's hacked a pipeline to bring a part of the United States to its knees as a warning. As in the he on the heels of another one he did in the fall, which which attacked sixteen thousand corporations, so he was sanctioned for that. And now Biden 
is going to have to sanction him for the next one. But quite frankly, he's escalating this. And this is, this is a cyber war. This is not a hack. This is not just a, a criminal gang inside Russia who's, who's trying to make 20 million bucks with ransomware. This is endorsed or they are looking the other way. So the whole thing is heating up in a very worrisome way. And Biden is supposed to meet in a summit probably the end of June with, with Putin. And I just, uh, I just think it's, it's very serious. Now, if they don't come down with the sanctions soon, the pipeline is supposed to be finished by July. The pipeline to Germany. Now, then it also gets complicated. The current government led by Angela Merkel is in favor of the pipeline. The Green Party, which is design, which is likely to win control over the coalition this fall, is adamantly opposed to the pipeline. So you say, well, why would, and they're supposed to win. There's no question of that, apparently. So why would he be racing Putin to finish the pipeline? Well, I'll tell you my guess. Once the pipeline is finished, even if it isn't hooked up, and the Green Party gets in, and next winter gets cold, we're going to suddenly have a headline saying that the pipelines in Russia feeding the Ukrainian system have collapsed, aren't working. Gee, you better hook up that pipeline. That's the game. That is the game. So, you know, it's, it's something I've been writing about. Um, I mean, it, it sounds, sorry, I'm just adjusting here, the lights in my eyes. Uh, it, it sounds to some people like, a, you know, Tom Clancy uh, geopolitical thriller. But this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a very ruthless, very cunning, and very difficult to defeat uh, predator in Mr. Putin. So that's the background. And that's the history. Let me just move so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so as you're adjusting, hopefully everything is all good. No problem. Perfect. I'm adjusted. Lovely. Okay. So moving on to our next question, and you kind of touched on this um, in your previous answer here, um, but how does this project particularly disproportionately shift the reliance of energy and power from Europe basically completely onto Russia? Well, Europe, uh, it's not completely, but uh, the gas is, is, um, is, is a very important factor in most of Central and Eastern European countries' power mix. Um, you know, Germany needs the gas desperately, and that's another reason it wants it, because ironically, the Green Party has forced it to close down its coal coal-fired plants and to um, abandon its nuclear reactors. So they're getting off nuclear, they're getting off coal. And natural gas is, is less harmful by a long shot than coal. So that's why the Germans are doing it. They're kind of doing it, but the Green Party doesn't buy that. They get, they get what's going on here. And besides, they don't want fossil fuel of any kind. They want completely renewable, which is not in the cards uh, for, for any country yet, because you know the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And you need a base load of power generated by nuclear or by fossil fuels. So what you've got is, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, energy uh, component. Um, I don't know what the mix is, but you've got countries like Hungary and, and the Czech Republic, they don't have a nuclear reactor. So they're very dependent on natural gas and probably coal, unfortunately, but they're all trying to clean up their acts. And Turkey is very dependent on Russian gas and, and so on. So, you know, it's, it could, if, if they play the game the way I think he would play it, uh, is, is that he will uh, cut off 
oil uh, gas supplies through Ukraine and and he'll do it in the winter and it'll be a catastrophe it'll it'll be a catastrophe for all of Europe Ukraine and Belarus mm -hmm. absolutely um, so now moving on to our next question, it looks more specifically at Ukraine and the ongoing situation um, on the Eastern Front. What does the completion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline mean for the war um, in Eastern Ukraine? Well, it's not directly, well, it's, it's not, you know, directly involved in the war. The war is you see, there's, there's two kinds of warfare that are going on, uh, always have gone on. There's what, I call, what, what you call a hot war, that's guns and soldiers. That's what's going on in the Donbass. And a hybrid war. And that's what, you know, pipelines are about, cyber attacks are about, um, special ops, espionage, sabotage, poisoning people, you know, disinformation campaigns, uh, helping uh, meddling in democratic elections to divide societies. All of this is, is part of the hybrid warfare that Putin has declared against democracies and capitalist countries, period. And so uh, the pipeline is part of the hybrid, but um, I, can't, I can't imagine, I mean, <laughs> If, if he's allowed to cut off supplies to Ukraine, that's a disaster. Now, I must say too, to complicate it a little bit more, he actually has cut off supplies to Ukraine, but lets them transport his gas to U Europe because it's the only thing he's got going for him now, himself now. So what does Ukraine do? It has to buy back the gas from the Europeans it shipped to buy back some of their gas at a higher price to take care of itself. So Russia's been denying Ukraine gas for about seven years. So if the Nord Stream 2 pipeline happens, there is no way gas is gonna flow through that Ukrainian pipeline and certainly no gas to Ukraine, which will collapse the economy. So what you've got, that's what the Americans are concerned about. And, and so what Ukraine is doing is, and they're not just sitting and twiddling their thumbs, they have plan B. They're building renewables as fast as they can and they're seeking sources elsewhere. They're seeking uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas um, supplies. They, they wanna build a plant and you know they're talking to uh, other other um, suppliers of gas. Uh, Norway is also shipping a lot of gas to Poland, to Lithuania. They have LNG plants. So, you know, they're, they're trying to shore it up as much as they can. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, Ukraine's, Ukraine's in a pickle. Yeah, you can say, you can say that again for sure. Um, so before I move on to our next question here, I just want to let our attendees know um, to put any questions that they might have in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar setup. Um, we will be doing some Q&A questions in a little bit, but this is your time to sort of prepare for that as well. Um, yeah, so moving into our next Thomas. question here. Oh, sorry about that. Um, moving into our next question here. What are the lasting effects of the pipeline on the marine ecosystem? So this kind of takes a sort of different and more environmental term here. Well, uh, the there are already, as I say, Turk Stream 1 and 2 are already pipelines under the Black Sea. They're built. They've landed at the other side. They're already built. Um, so I guess they passed ecological muster. I don't know. Uh, the Baltic Sea is a little different story. And, uh, but I don't think that's what I worry about. What I worry about is once that Baltic Sea pipeline, both those pipelines are operating, then Putin will use that as an excuse to put his military boats 
in the Baltic Sea to patrol this essential infrastructure that's there. And now he's encroaching into NATO territory and, and he's gonna have you know airplanes flying over, buzzing over. I mean, the guy doesn't stop. He's got to be, how you play him is you anticipate his every move. And that's why I, I was surprisingly smart of the Americans to come up with these sanctions when they did. Because they're doing for Europe what Europe obviously can't do for itself. They can't get their act together. Mm -hmm, for sure. So we have one question already in the chat here. Um, now that this pipeline project is most likely going to go through and be completed in a short amount of time, what can the West and Ukraine do? Well, as I say, uh, the just getting it completed and hooked up uh, in Germany doesn't mean it's going to operate yet. And I interviewed the head of one of the important fellows in the Green, the German Green Party, who's in the European Parliament, and he said they're not going to get approval for it. There's no way. There's already a, a number of lawsuits that the Greens have, any uh, environmentalists have waged to prevent the operation of it, the licensing of it. They have to go through a very difficult licensing process and the Greens are gonna fight it tooth and nail internally in Germany, during which time, you know, the gas, if they want cash flow, Russia does, is gonna keep flowing through Ukraine. And, and so that, that is what's gonna happen. But I said to the German, I said, well, they'll just blow up the pipeline feeding the Ukrainian pipeline and then you'll be forced to hook it up or freeze in the dark. And he said, I don't wanna speculate on whether that would happen or not. But, you know, we have not allowed them to disrupt our supplies in the past and we won't again. Again, he, he, he didn't want to speculate like I did, but that's exactly what they'll do. And then when the gas stops flowing, there'll be a big scream and a hue and a cry, you know, license it, get it operating. And then it's over. Now, Germany has also maintained in their negotiations with the Biden administration that, look, we want the pipeline, you don't want the pipeline, but guess what? We'll make sure that there's always a lot of gas, Russian gas flowing through the Ukrainian pipeline. Now, how are they gonna make sure of that? That's not worth the paper it's written on. It's not. So, you know, once, once they're, they're under the, the thumb of Mr. Putin, they'll do what he wants them to do. That's right. So our next question um, from one of our attendees here, Angela Merkel is doing long-term st strategic damage to Germany and the Western Alliance by her unreserved support of Nord Stream 2. Considering Absolutely. German companies can make money on the current transit routes through Ukraine, what other motive can she have? Well, remember she's in a coalition. She doesn't have a majority and she's a coalition person. And unfortunately her coalition partner is the socialist party with deep roots in Russia and in communism. And the socialist party leader was a guy named, is a guy named Gerhard Schroeder who's Putin's best friend and I'm not kidding. He is now the chairman of the board of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline company, Mr. Schroeder, the German. And he's also the chairman of the board of the Rosneft oil company, which is the biggest oil company in Russia. So this guy's making millions of dollars. He's always there. They have birthday parties for one another. He's a real pal of Putin's. He's a total sellout and he doesn't care about anything except getting rich and helping Germany. He doesn't care. 
And, you know, of course, we know that signing a pact with Stalin didn't help Germany. They thought it would. Germany will have maybe have to learn the hard way, but the problem is everybody else will too. Mm -hmm. So that's your reason. Mr. Schroeder has huge influence over, over the business community because of all the goodies he's offering them with this gas deal with Russia, which won't last. And, and he's, he's got huge uh, uh, influence over the party that shares power with Angela Merkel. That's her problem. Mm -hmm. um, so another question that we received in the chat here, um, it appears that every time the international community enforces sanctions against Russia, Putin reacts as a bully, for lack of better term here, and threatens violence, such as the recent buildup of Russian militia at the Ukrainian border. Do you think it is possible to counter that sort of bullying? Is it, as you sort of said earlier, about trying to predict and counteract Russia's moves? Are there other things the international community could or should be doing, in your opinion? Well, you know, I mean, I do not understand why Biden doesn't kill Nord Stream 2, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, legally what he's supposed to be doing, because the sanctions were passed in December before he became president. He inherited a, a demand from the Congress to impose these sanctions on Nord Stream 2. He, he is supposed to do this, and he hasn't. And I don't know what he's doing. They're negotiating something with the Germans. I don't know what the Germans could possibly offer the Americans. I mean, in, in, in you know, I, I mean, so it's, it's a big mystery and people don't know. So, you know, and, but Biden is not stupid. He doesn't like the pipeline and he doesn't like Putin. We know that. So I have to believe that he's playing a chess game as well. And I think he's saving the Nord Stream 2 um, uh, sanctions, which will crush the whole project, $11 billion worth, crush the whole project. Uh, I think he's reserving that for um, maybe, a, maybe soon. If, for instance, the pipeline shutdown in the US is traced back even a bit to the Kremlin, then there goes the Nord Stream too. He would have no choice. Mm. So our next question that we have here, um, actually, let me go to another one, back to sort of the Biden issue that we're sort of discussing here. It sounds like Biden is taking a soft stance on blocking Nord Stream 2 yet he is blocking Canada's pipeline, so the Keystone XL and Line 5. The Canadian government should be outraged. Why has Trudeau been so quiet on Nord Stream 2 and the US hypocrisy? Why, why has, well, it's, it's not hypocritical. Every pipeline project is a different reason. Um, the, the Americans, uh, I mean, look, the Americans blocked Keystone because it was oil sands and they believe that it will make the environment more polluted by bringing in massive amounts of oil sands product from Canada. So that was an environmental reason. I would argue that, you know, blocking Nord Stream 2 is not an environmental reason. It's a security reason. It's a security of supply and it's a geopolitical reason, um, it, very different reasons. And uh, so they're not, they don't, they're, not, they're not related at all. Pipelines aren't all pipelines. And uh, as far as uh, Trudeau not complaining about what, uh, what uh, the Americans have done in terms of canceling Keystone, is that he's a, you know, he's a big greenie. He's secretly rooting it on, which is suicide for our country's economy. Mr. Trudeau, I'm not a fan of. I think he's way out of his depth. But the guy was a ski board instructor before he became prime minister. He was a drama teacher briefly 
before he became prime minister. He doesn't have any credentials to run anything this complicated, like a gigantic economy and country called Canada. He is really out of his depth. And so, you know, he not only, his, his, his foreign policies have all been um, dreadful. Um, his, I mean, his, his whole mishandling of China and, and, and the US to a certain extent. I mean, he just, he, he shouldn't be there. He shouldn't have the job. He should never have been elected. Mm -hmm. So moving back to looking at Russia and everything that's going on with the pipeline back in the on the European side of things there, um, you mentioned Russia's economy heavily relies on their gas production. If this pipeline were to be stopped, how would this affect Russia and would there potentially be any negative or dangerous backlash? Well, if the pipeline were stopped, uh... Putin would be furious because they've spent billions of dollars on it and he's gambling on it and it's part of his strategy. But if it were stopped, they'd still pump gas through Ukraine. They'd still make money. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't bring them to their knees or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, so but they don't have any much else going for them besides oil and gas. I mean, that's not a very, I mean, it's a military di dictatorship uh, and the people have living standards probably as low as Mozambique's and it's, it's just dreadful. And, and, you know, he rules it with an iron fist and, you know, they don't have tech startups. They don't have a Silicon Valley. They don't have anything going for them except military industrial complex and oil and gas. Uh, John McCain, the, the late Senator John McCain, once nastily called Russia a gasoline station posing as a nation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, give me a second here to get my screen back in order. Um, so kind of tapping into that strategy that you sort of mentioned here, um, that Putin has probably at the back of his back of his head there. Um, how does Nord Stream 2 fit into the long-term strategic interests of Russia? And if applicable, how could it fit into the strategic interests of a potential Sino-Russian alliance in Europe, given China's already expanding Belt and Road Initiative? Wow, okay. Well, let's let that that's a lot of different questions, but uh... Russia and China have an uneasy alliance. They're both frightened of one another. I see them in a very different light. I see China as ruthless economically, less so in other ways. Uh, and they have concentrated on giving their people a better quality of life and have succeeded it the average Chinese person lives better than the average Russian, even though there's a billion and a half of them. That tells you everything. So China has been mostly preoccupied with looking after itself. And by doing that, they've been very tough competitors. Oh, they cheat, sure, they've cheated. They steal intellectual property. They subsidize exports. They play all the games that they have to play to deliver a better living standard for a billion and a half people. Russia, on the other hand, is run by a megalomaniac and his coterie of cronies who are just harvesting the wealth out from under the Russian people. And he has this reconquest revanchist attitude that he wants to restore the Soviet Union and the satellites in Europe. And he will not stop until he does that. So whatever he does is aimed at that. So you wanna hurt Europe? Okay. You get involved with a massive disinformation campaign to help the Brexit happen. Did it, worked. You wanna impair the Americans? Get involved in Facebook and Twitter and backing a crazy idiot like Donald Trump to become president. 
who also, and then surrounding him with Russian guys. And they did that. And it's really disrupted the United States. Russia's fingerprints are all over election meddling in France, in Germany, in Hungary, in Poland, in Italy, wherever they can cause dissension and damage democracies in capitalist countries, that's what they want to do. And so they are also very involved in, in uh, military adventures. Not only is Donbass and Crimea the latest, but look at, they've just picked up Belarus. They've picked up a piece of Armenia and that's heating up again. That's going to end up being a hot war. They picked up pieces of Georgia. They picked up Moldova. They are now well ensconced in Syria. I'm told that the city of Aleppo, which was the second largest city in Syria, that only Russian is spoken in that city, what's left of it. They have two Mediterranean warm water ports, Russian ports in Syria now because they help that guy commit genocide. They're also setting up shop in Libya. They are all over Africa. So this is, this is the old empire thing. This is the old Cold War. And the Americans are the enemy number one. Now, as far as China, they know and they never would try to conquer China. And in fact, I think they're frightened of China. And I think that's a good thing. And then there's also the issue of the Central Asian republics that are mostly Oriental. Who's going to get those? Is Russia going to be able to recapture all those? Or is China going to get them? Or are they going to remain independent, which is unlikely? So you've got these uh, competing uh, rogue nations. Um, and you know China's, China's meddling too to get influence in its region. So it's like they carved up the world like the Portuguese and Spanish did. You have this bit, you know, we'll take everything west of, of Moscow plus Russia and, and you take, you take uh, Asia. And so they're leading, the Chinese are making nasty noises and scaring the heck out of Taiwan. The Chinese have been involved in the coup d'etat, which in, in Myanmar, which just overthrew a democratic country. Um, I wonder if the Chinese, of course they've attacked parts of India. That's their big rival in Asia, India. And now we see the devastation over COVID in India. And I wonder if some of that wasn't exported. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of interested to hear more about one particular point you mentioned there, how Russia's almost scared of China. And that's why like there might not be sort of either any interaction or invasion on that end. So would you mind elaborating a little bit more? Nope. Well, yeah, no, uh, if, if you go to the archive of my Substack newsletter, you'll see, you'll see uh, I've written a number of articles that are about Russia and Ukraine. One is called Putin's Rasputin. Go and look at that one. And that is Putin's playbook. It was written by a former KGB and a general and lays out the, uh, conquest of the world by Russia. And it's very, it's a very scary uh, plan, but the, he's executing it. And I think he believes in it. So it's called Putin's Rasputin. And, uh, and in that plan, uh, they carve up the world. And, you know, Russia gets Europe and the Middle East and China gets Asia. That's the deal. China um, can't, it can't, China could never, I mean, Russia, Russia would be obliterated by China. And yeah. I don't see China as, 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 as dangerous like Russia. I see them as 
ambitious and ruthless. And okay, fine. Yes, they did take over Hong Kong, which was not nice. And they would like Taiwan, but these are also kind of ethnic things too. Those are places that are populated by Chinese people and, and speak the same language and have the same culture. And I think China just, and, and they're both hugely successful. So it's sort of, you know, like a takeover of it, a successful company that's owned by your cousin. And, and, you know, but, but the Russians are, you know, I mean, they, they don't care who they kill, how they kill, how many they kill of their own as well. It's a whole other group. And if you read Putin's Rasputin, you'll see that this guy Dugan, who, he, who he's been inspired for, sounds very much, um, has had a philosophy very much like Hitler's. And that is that the Russians are a white race and they're superior to the rest. So here we go again. It's very scary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so kind of bringing it back um, to the other side of the ocean here in Canada, um, do you believe that Canada is doing enough to help stop Nord Stream 2? I think Canada is not really a player in all of this. And I'm sure, you know, I mean, it's it's a very loyal NATO member. I mean, uh, we sent we sent peacekeepers to uh, Lithuania or Latvia or something. Uh, and and we've got, you know, uh, people in uh, in in Europe uh, and and we're solidly on the side of whatever NATO does. But as far as moral influence and sway, Canada is just not in the league to do any of that, um, especially under this prime minister. So, you know, you've got, uh, now Canada was very important when Mulroney and Raina Titian, who was Ukrainian, were in charge when the, when the, when the Iron Curtain was falling and the Soviet Union was dis, dis, dissembling. And when uh, Ukraine declared independence in 1991, Canada, Mulroney and Natishan stepped up as the only developed country in the world to first recognize Ukraine as an independent nation. That was enormously important. So we've played a big role because our diaspora is big and influential in Canada. Canada has the biggest Ukrainian diaspora in the world. And they're very successful and influential. I mean, the, the head of the state, the governor general was a Ukrainian from Saskatchewan, Raina Titian. So the influence is there, the sympathy is there and the diaspora has done an awful lot to help Ukraine fight corruption, uh, build export industries, network. It's been very good. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and I guess before we sort of wrap things up here, I will give everyone um, that's participating here, attendees, uh, one last minute or a couple of minutes to get your questions in the Q&A section. Um, but kind of touching on that note that you just sort of ended off there, um, as particularly with Susk and like post-secondary students, post-secondary Ukrainian students in Canada here, is there anything that we can do to contribute to um, either stopping the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, helping people get educated? What do you recommend that we sort of do and how should we approach this as students? Well, I think it would be, um, um, I think it's important to become politically aware. I think it's important that young Ukrainians, if they haven't already, which I'm sure most of you have, go there stay with relatives or friends or just travel the country and talk to people and find out what's going on. Um, and, and I think it's very important to um, contact uh, politicians in the federal government here and let them know that, you know, you think it's very important that Canada stays the course and, and that we don't uh, allow um, you know, we, we have no, no way of, of changing the Nord Stream 2 situation, but um, we certainly can, can do our bit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't believe we have anything coming up in the Q&A 
as of right now. Um, so without further ado, I would like to thank you again, um, Ms. Francis, for taking the time out of your day to speak with us. Um, I'm sure all of our uh, attendees learned a lot. I know I did, um, and it was a real honor speaking to you this evening and moderating this debate. Um, so, oh, I believe we have a last minute question here. Um, yeah, so I guess just your thoughts on this. Uh, NATO leaders are meeting on June 14th. Perhaps this is a way to get Germany to support Ukraine's NATO membership action plan. So if you have any sort of closing thoughts or thoughts around this. Yeah, I think it's very important, not just for Ukraine, but for Georgia and for um, some of the other, I think there's six uh, Eastern European countries uh, that have been left out of Ukraine, uh, out of NATO. And so I think that it, it is probably correct that uh, fast tracking them directly into NATO at this point would be um, a red flag for Putin and he may do something very awful in direct response to that because you are dealing with a ruthless person. Uh, but what I would do is what Putin does. I would create a separate organization which gives them de facto NATO membership, like being advisors on an advisory committee. In other words, have a NATO once removed for those countries, but very much tied to NATO and protected by NATO without being NATO members, which seems to be something that would make him go berserk. So I, I don't think we have to poke the bear more than we have to poke the bear. Um, just like, think of it as a similar gambit that Putin just did. And that is that, you know, he probably didn't order the shutdown of the pipeline in the United States directly. He probably didn't have his KGB do it directly, but there was a gang doing it in Russia that they knew about and they looked the other way. So it was an attack once removed. It gives him some plausible deniability, but it doesn't get him off the hook. So likewise, I think if you let Ukraine and the other countries who are outside of NATO and desperately want to be inside of NATO, have a once removed NATO membership, then I think I don't see how he can object. Well, he certainly will object. I don't see what he can do about it. And it certainly wouldn't be an act of war, which he regards making Ukraine a NATO member to be. Mm -hmm, perfect. And I think that wraps everything up. Um, so again, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, and thank you to everyone who managed to join in uh, on the webinar, as well as to all our lovely viewers on Facebook as well. Um, my name is Alexandra Holick, and we had Diane Francis here today with us. Um, stay tuned for future Susk events pertaining to our Russian aggression campaign, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.